My name is Jennifer Ann Champion, and I've been invited to read to you some poems that I have written over the years. The first poem I'm going to read is from my last book, which was written in 2016. That is called Catawall, printed by Math Paper Press. The poem I'm going to read is called Here is a Reproduction. This poem is about a drawing I remember making as a child. I think I was about five. And I remember my grandmother was very angry with me for making this drawing. And I did not feel competent enough to use English at the time to explain myself and what I was actually trying to draw. And so uh, this is the, the drawing right here. I reproduced it as an adult. So here is a reproduction. Here is a reproduction of the drawing she made for her grandmother. Imagine instead of these adult ink lines, all is pastel. These, the adult girl can tell you, are haystacks. But the little girl doesn't know what the word for haystack is. She doesn't know any words except, Grandma, look. The word haystack. What sounds might she use to make such magic into being, into understanding, into being understood? The adult girl can tell you, mimicry, crude, yes. But it's little me thinking of that reproduction of the Gleaners by Jean-Francois Millet, the Glenus, completed in 1857 in oils, lovingly hand-pieced by my mother and aunt in hobbyist-grade cardboard jigsaw bits, hanging with pride in my grandma's dining, in my grandma's dining room, now demolished. A much more sophisticated answer than cut and dried scribble or jigsaw riddle. The grandmother will tell the little girl that she has drawn a church, an awful, awful church. Why is the cross upside down? And the little girl says, it's not a church, not a church. It's a, what is it then? Not a church. But the old woman keeps picking at her, stripping her of all confidence in the face of not knowing what to say, what it is, what it is, what it is. What is it? Not a steeple, not the people in the pew turning back to look at you as you enter like a dove bearing peace between your teeth. What is this? Not the fingers, not the yellow rectangle of your nails pointing to what I have made and have no way to tell you. Not your what is this being made wholly out of mistaking a pitchfork for a cross. Young lady, you are going to hell, she tells me definitively. Not a church, I answer. The, the reason I am, I was so attracted to writing poetry in my 20s is because you know, even though I'm a confident English speaker, I feel a great anxiety articulating myself. I, I had difficulty socializing and communicating and learning to communicate at an early age because I was often uh, profiled for the way that I look. And so I was told that I could not participate in lessons sometimes because they were, it wasn't relevant to me or I did not pass for a certain race and therefore I could not be allowed to learn the language. A lot of that time I mean, the kindergarten part of it, at least, is featured in, in this book, 
in the earlier part of it, and also in my poem Ballet Class, which is the, the poem that most people remember me for. That is my most popular poem. So if you're interested to read about that, you can pick up Caterwall, or you can pick up The History of Clocks, which is where Ballet Class is printed. So the next poem that I want to read is from A History of Clocks. A History of Clocks is printed by Red Wheelbarrow Books. This was actually my first solo book of poetry. The poem I'm going to read is called Let It Shine. I wrote it because I was part of a project that focused on the neighborhood of Tiong Bahru, and I was given a specific location to write about, which was the air raid shelter which is still preserved at Moguan Terrace. When I was researching it, I came across a documentary by Channel News Asia of a woman who was born there during the bombings of Singapore in World War II. And I was struck by the visuals of her touching all the, the jagged brick that was in this room and sort of trying to recall this atmosphere which she could only ever have been told about because she was a child. And then when I told my parents that I was writing this poem, she, they, they told me that uh, you're actually related to this woman. She is a uh, part of our extended family. And so I met her. Her name is Mary Magdalene Pereira. A lot of the details that are in this poem pretty much are directly from conducted directly from the interview that I had with her about her story and her memories of this place and of her father. So this poem is called Let It Shine. She fills her hands with plasticine and molds a cast of her father's face. He must be handsome. All soldiers are. He must be smart. All daddies are. He must come home with a jar of candied stars to scatter across the hungry years. In between gaps, she fills ravenous hands with jagged brick, tongues to lick her path clean with stories. Her mother tells of the morgue that day, floor a sheen with blood. And her older brother makes impressions of the sirens and bombs, the woo, the woo, the woo, the whistle. The searchlights in 1942, seeking out the tiny girl in the belly of her mother, all the tiny people running under plain fire, they were gushing in the fields into drains out their houses. Those who made it to the shelters were considered lucky. Where was he? Kelly, the husband, teacher, now volunteer soldier, Kelly, that morning, pressing a picture of Our Lady of Perpetual Help into his pregnant wife's hands and kissing his son's goodbye. Kelly, was he still watched over by Our Lady Mary? Her mother couldn't answer in the rush down the tunnel. Dimlit brick held her hands in a silent prayer, for somewhere beyond the reach of their fingers, still in an unventilated room beneath the earth, a hundred people shuddered with loved ones and the hope for loved ones out in open war. And that was when the unborn girl chose to cry out. Let your light shine. A line and a motto from her father's school days. Let your light shine. This tiny baby stirred by death. Let your light shine, she cried, arriving on concrete, hard with premonitions that Kelly was lost. Let your light shine, they would later find the shrapnel embedded in his chest and a flat broken in by the same blast that had taken him away. They and so many families wandering in straight settlements unsettled. Let your light shine. And 46 days after, crawling out from that shelter, they named her Mary, this child with no crib for a bed and she would be her mother's joy, a spark trembling long after the light of the south had set. Let your light shine, because if nothing else, there is a little part nestled in us that can warm up the darkness just by being there if we choose to give birth to it.
Now the woo and the whistle are gone. The war is long over. Mary stands in the shelter, filling ravenous hands of jagged brick to steady her feet, as the television cameras, as television cameras ask her what this empty air raid shelter means to her. But the walls have ears, and if you are quiet, mouths to echo what they have seen. They say, let your light shine under three meters of ground. Let your light shine in between round buttons of uniform. Let it shine before others so they can see through the storm. See a way when you're gone. Let it shine. Poems are a way of memorializing memories. And while I'm glad to have done that for her, I don't think you need to wait for a poet to come along and articulate that poem for you. Uh, anyone can do it. I started doing it not even feeling particularly confident in my ability to use language. But sometimes that is all that is needed is the willingness to try. I don't know if my poems are that good, but people seem to appreciate them. The only thing you can, can do is to just keep trying. You know, when I think about it, I actually haven't been writing that long. I'm going to read a poem now, which I think was probably the first poem of mine that was ever published in a book. And it was published in Cinco Remo. This is a running anthology. This one was edited by Joshua Ip, Puja Nancy, and An Ang. Senko Rimo is a community of writers from all over the place. I wouldn't even say just Singapore, but from all walks of life. And you do not have to be a published poet or a literature student to, to join in and basically play with language. Good English is not a Queen's English. It's not an A1 in English. It is your ability to communicate well. It is your commitment to using language to communicate across culture. The poem I wrote was from day 14 which is write a poem about yourself in which nothing you say is true. And when I thought about this prompt, I thought the most convincing way to lie is to actually tell the truth. I am a unicorn, but no one believes me. The truth is I am a unicorn, but no one believes me. People ask if you're a unicorn, Where's your horn? But I'm too embarrassed to tell them how every other month I trim mine down and sell it to a sensei. And even the sensei looks doubtful. But I tell him, you shouldn't judge a unicorn by its horn or lack thereof. It's just keratin. There are worse things to sell away, like your dignity. The dignity of a unicorn lies in its tail, its iridescent paleness made richer by stories. I feed on myth. I feed on folk tales spun from the mouths of my grandparents. But lately, when this unicorn picks up the morning paper, it makes her sad. This unicorn licks the sugar cubes meant for her tea, finds it all fake and aspartame -y. This makes her sad. This unicorn goes to work and teaches children to sing about happy places, but the children get more cynical each year. Ask, Ch, why are you always so happy? This makes her sad. Unicorns were made to gallop in fields and ruminate by rivers. Now this unicorn just tweets like everyone else, shortens experiences and life expectancies to five minute rants and carries on. People ask if you're a unicorn, how do you type? And I'm too sad to remind them 
that for every question wrapped in disbelief, another piece of magic falls off. Soon I will take off my shoes and find I have feet for hooves. This too will make me sad. The stories will be replaced with fact. The facts will be replaced with figures. My figure may very well be replaced by a number. One is a very lonely number indeed. Why do rhinos get to be a protected species? I am not bitter. I am a unicorn. But no one believes in unicorns anymore.